Okay, uh, yeah, let's start it. So yeah, thanks, Anusha. Thank you. I'm doing fine. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so we we we're looking at instances in the Book of Acts where we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where we read about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So there's some things that we can learn about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it's important for us to know as believers. Okay, the first thing. Uh, is that it is for all believers. This is for all believers, all of them, all who who accept Jesus, who invite Jesus as their Lord. Okay, uh, and several other learnings. Let's look at a few. Okay. Um, Okay, so since we, uh, you know, we looked at in detail each of those five instances, we won't revisit that again. You can go through in the notes, but uh, I'm just picking up from, you know, um, page 13 or 14 in your physical notes, um, where we have a summary of those five instances. Okay, and there are learnings. Right, first of the thing, first, firstly, this is what we see that in three of the five cases, five instances. That they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, first of all, <coughs> they were first baptized in the Holy Spirit and later baptized in water. Like we read about Saul, we read about Cornelius' house, and uh, probably in the 120 also. Okay, so we we see that. Then we see that. Uh, uh, what are some things that we learn? I'm just going to scroll here. We see that when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, it is for the purpose of clothing us with power, that we receive power, and we see that there is a release of what we could call as gifts of the Spirit, spiritual gifts. Right? We see at least two gifts that are mentioned. One is gift of tongues. And also we see gift of prophecy. These two things that are accompanying or that are released. Okay. Now, uh, in those five instances, so we can we know that okay, this when we when when the Lord Jesus said that it is to fill you with power, it is to display that power, right? In being a witness, in being a witness with power. And which means that it is accompanying the gifts of the spirit, right? The most common thing being gift of tongues that we see there. So the Holy Spirit who comes, who overpowers, who overwhelms, who baptizes, he comes with all these gifts and releases these gifts among us. So that's something that we see, right? He works these gifts through the believer, OK? Um, the power that we receive. We receive power to be witnesses. The power that we will receive, one of the ways in which this is expressed or displayed. Okay. See, for example, there is power that is flowing, and because of which the bulb is switched on. Right? There's electricity there. We can say, yeah, there is there is electricity. When the power goes off, when the lights go off, then we know that hey, there's no power that is there's no power. When the light is on, we know there's power, right? So you know that there is power because of certain things that are happening, because of the display of the light, the light that comes on. Similarly, the display of the power of the Holy Spirit, one of the ways, is through the expression of the gifts, right? The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit expressed through the life of the believer is through the gifts. Okay. So we need to, you know, we need to understand that. <clears throat> Other ways, yes, transformed lives, right? It's a it's a big thing. The way you live your life, that is a that is again a, you know, uh, the way you lived your life and the way your life was transformed, that is a big story by itself, or a big uh, what do you say, a proof of the power of God, right? Because Saul's life 
one day he's persecuting has encounter baptized then goes on to preach right drastic transformation you know he's going to damascus on the way to damascus arresting from damascus preaching can you just believe that persecuting preaching right so that itself is a demonstration of the power of god right the transformative power of god radically changed right but it's it need not stop with that alone many times we see okay transform lives power of god yes but also when we look at these instances we see that the expression of the power god wants to display his power through the gifts of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit are valid expressions of the holy spirit are you know valid displays of the power of god because we know it is the power of god it's not a human ability it's not human talent uh, it is the power of god flowing in and through ordinary believers right so that is something that we understand okay uh, the most common gift that we see seems to be the gift of tongues right we we looked at that let me let me just rephrase i mean um reiterate that once again right we looked at the first, what is the first one acts chapter 2 120 disciples filled with the spirit prayed in tongues it was very visible very tangible everybody was amazed marveled perplexed all that happened because they heard second time samaria philip goes preaches people are sorry save peter and john go lay hands pray they are filled with the spirit we don't know whether they prayed in tongues right but simon who was a sorcerer he saw something supernatural happen excuse me sorry guys he saw something supernatural happen and he said he took his wallet and said here's the money i want this also so we know the second second instance something supernatural happened third instance which is acts chapter 9 saul who became paul has an encounter ananias goes and says you know i've come so that i may lay hands on you and that you might receive your sight so he lays hand scales fall off his eyes he receives his sight and the bible says he was baptized right prays receives his sight and he is baptized okay and the bible does not say he prayed in tongues right but we know he started praying in tongues or he he did pray in tongues because he writes to the corinthians and he says 1 corinthians 14 he says i pray in tongues more than you all and in fact he writes to them and establishes this is how tongues must be practiced in your personal life in a in a public setting this is how the whole gift of tongues must be practiced so we know that he understood he practiced in his own life and he's teaching the church also third instance fourth one house of cornelius right? peter goes there he's preaching the gospel even as he's preaching they are receiving they're hearing they're so happy they are filled with the holy spirit and they begin to pray in tongues right so the jews who are with peter they are all stunned you know they have also just like us they have received just like what happened to us it's happening to them right so they are again praying in tongues speaking in tongues and then peter gets them baptized in water so something that we see is that this baptism in water and praying in tongues there need not be an order the only thing is that you need to get saved before all this happens right you need to receive jesus as your lord and savior that's the only thing should i be baptized in water and then i'll be you know will i be filled with the holy spirit and pray in tongues and gifts and all or what should be the order of things it does not matter Right? Because in Cornelius' house, this is how it happened. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter says, hey, can I stop them from being baptized in water? And then gets, gets them to be baptized in water. Okay. Then, <clears throat> the last one that we 
read about in Acts chapter 19 is uh, in Ephesus. Paul goes there. Now, Paul, who has been persecuting, now is preaching, right? So he goes there, and the first question he asks them is, you know, he finds out that they are disciples of Jesus, they are followers of the Lord Jesus. The first question he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? What a strange way to greet a church or greet a gathering of believers. Just imagine. So we see that this was a practice in the early church. Because Peter and John, when they went from Jerusalem to Samaria, the first thing they do, or they are sent with that purpose, that they might lay hands and pray for them, they might receive the Holy Spirit. So this was an early church practice. To teach, to pray for, to minister, that people be filled with the, be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is something they expected, something they taught and ministered. So that is what we see in Acts chapter 19, that they, it says very clearly, that they prayed in tongues and they also prophesied. Okay, so we see that out of these five times, we see clearly that three, it very specifically mentions that they prayed in tongues. What are those three times? The disciples. 120 disciples. Second time? No, no. It very clearly says the text of where they prayed in tongues. Cornelius' house. House of Cornelius, Peter, right? Then the third one, Ephesus. And Paul is there in Ephesus and he's ministering. And so three times we see very specifically that they, it is mentioned that they prayed in tongues. The other two times are in Samaria, Paul's life. Paul's life, we know for sure he prayed in tongues, though it's not mentioned there. When he was baptized, he started praying in tongues. Eventually, if not then, eventually. So four times we see that this is the outcome. So the one remaining is Samaria. Right? Samaria where Peter and John go and pray. But we know that something very supernatural happened, something very very visible, they could, they could hear, they could see. It was supernatural that Simon gave money. He was willing to give money to receive that gift so that he might also lay hands and pray for us. Of course, his motivation and intention was something else, right? Because he was a, he was a magician. People looked at him, looked up to him. They said, wow, this is the great power of God, etc. But now he was losing that influence, right? He was something which was greater, even more powerful. Uh, even though he had become a believer, he still his motivation was wrong, and therefore Peter rebukes him. Right, but the fact is that something very valid happened, and we could conclude that it was praying in tongues, or maybe it was prophecy. We don't know. Right. So the thing is this: that um, there is this common gift which seems to be uh, there in expression in operation, which is the gift of tongues. Okay, so we we don't have to doubt. We don't. We can expect in faith. Okay? Maybe there are some of us here who have not yet started praying in tongues. Okay, so don't shut yourself out and say, okay, it's not for me. Okay, many times we say, no, uh, this gift is for you. This gift is for me. No, that's for you. This is for me. No, that it is for you also. So don't exclude yourself. Don't say that. You know, praying in tongues is not for me. Or maybe some other will you see some other believer, you know, who's been, you know, who's been waiting on the Lord and struggling, etc. Don't say maybe, you know, in, in order to feel make them feel good, we say, you know, maybe there's some other gift, you know, for you. God has already given you this. Maybe this is not for you. No, that's not scriptural, right? So God wants to. Okay. So uh, let's look at some common questions. Yeah. And we will address you know, some of these questions. And maybe after that, if you have some more questions, we can talk about that also. OK, um, okay so um, some common questions here. What is the difference between indwelling and baptism? I think uh, we addressed this earlier. But let's look at it. Indwelling, meaning the Holy Spirit is always with, already with you. So that's a common question. When I became a believer, did I receive the Holy Spirit or not? Yes. Then what is this again receiving the Holy Spirit? <laughs> right? So 
that's a very valid question people ask you know i received the holy spirit already he's already god omnipotent all knowing ever present god what is this this again receiving thing but the fact is we know that is he is infinite there's more to him than we can even imagine right so yes he indwells us right but we also know that is an he's an infinite god right He's an infinite God, and so He wants to make more of Himself available for us. And this is some this is something that is very, very scriptural. This baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is for those for whom the Holy Spirit has already come and He's indwelling for the believer, right? Those who have invited Jesus, the Holy Spirit is dwelling, but this is for those. Right, so we see that that uh, you know the Holy Spirit indwells us, but He is infinite, and there's more to Him, and He wants to pour more of Himself in this manner. In fact, everywhere we saw whatever we saw in Book of Acts, we see we see that people were actually believers. They came to know the Lord. Right, they experienced Jesus in Samaria. There was great rejoicing. They came to the Lord, right? The first instance, they were already believers. They were already in prayer. They were waiting, which means they had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit already. And this is something that the Lord wants to give more, it is because He is an infinite God. There is more of Him, and He wants to take the believers, all the believers, through this, right? So the, we see this. Um, you know, uh, one example, the way we uh, we can explain it is how the Lord Jesus explained it. John chapter four, John chapter seven. Okay, so you can rem you can remember that John chapter four, John chapter seven. Let's look at that verse. Um, in John chapter four and verse thirteen, this is in response to the woman at the well. She asked that question. You know, you don't have any. You know, vessel to draw the water. What is this living water that you can give? So this is what the Lord says. The Lord Jesus answered and said to her, "Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life." Okay. So he's saying. The water that I give, or what I'm going to give, will become in him a spring, a fountain, a spring, springing a fountain of life, spring, sorry, fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. Then John chapter seven, verses 37 and 39, 37 to 39. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, "If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said." Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. Verse 39, very important, he's explaining. Okay. This he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay. So he's talking about the promise of the Father. Because he said, you know, when I go, I will send, right? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. So here, uh, John is explaining, you know, this he spoke concerning the Spirit, because he, whom he has promised, uh, whom we, those believing in him would receive, and that would happen when Jesus goes to be glorified. Okay, so what do we see in these two passages? We see a difference in water level. Yes or no? Both talks about water, right? But in one, John chapter 4, Lord Jesus is talking about a fountain. Those believing in him would receive something, that eternal life. I shall give in him, give in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Second one, John chapter 7, is talking about a river of life. And that's a specific reference to the Holy Spirit, whom, whom those believing in him would receive once he goes to the Father. Okay, So yes, the fountain 
is there. Holy Spirit's presence, the eternal life is already there in those who receive Jesus, those who believe in Him. But the river begins to operate when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? So out of the heart will flow rivers of life-giving water, a living water. Okay. So we know that you know a river does so much more. Right? We see uh, when the, where the river is, there is life, there is civilization, there is greenery. It's touching, impacting. Wherever the river flows, there is change, right? impacting. Right? So powerful. Okay, so we see that. So indwelling and baptism, this is the difference. Okay, so we understand that. Any questions on this? Further questions? Sorry. Any further questions? Indwelling, baptism. So if anybody asks you, okay, what is the difference? Would you be able to explain? Yeah? Right? So somebody comes and says, you know, I already have the Holy Spirit. Why are you praying for baptism? I don't need. Right? So we should be able to share from the word and say hey, this is this is what Jesus said it's not you saying it's not me trying to tell you something but this is something valid which Jesus himself promised if you want to walk in what Jesus promised then we can pray right okay um, yeah once again indwelling baptism right okay so the word indwelling, what does it mean? Indwelling, dwelling inside, right? So every believer has the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, several verses that testify to that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, etc. Um, uh, we can look at uh, maybe Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 13, 14, okay? Verses 13 and 14, Ephesians chapter 1. And we were looking at, uh, you know, you can read those verses. The Lord Jesus explained in John chapter 4, John chapter 7. Okay, he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. So John chapter 4, he's talking about how those believing in him will receive everlasting life. And, you know, the, he says, it uses the term water. The water that I give... If someone receives, they will never thirst again. But in him, it will become a fountain of life, springing up to everlasting life. Okay. So, which means that his life is changing now. It's He has received everlasting life. And he's referring to something that, that we receive from Jesus. Right? Um, John chapter 7 is again talking about something that those believing in him would receive. But here, John, in verse 39, John chapter 7, verse 39, he explains that Jesus is talking about the Spirit. Right? He's saying that, uh, let's read that verse again, John chapter 7. He who believes in me, out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. That's verse 39, 38, sorry. So he, this is about the Holy Spirit. John explains, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, so he's talking about a different picture. It's not a fountain, but it's a river that will flow out. Okay, so he's explaining that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, over and above that, when we look at all those instances in the book of Acts, and the promise of the Lord Jesus to the believers, right? He said, you go, you wait, I will send the promise of the Father. Okay, now these are people who had already started following Jesus, right? In Samaria, we looked at Jerusalem, we looked at Samaria, uh, Pete, oh, sorry, Paul's life, Cornelius' house, Ephesus, all these people were, you know, people who were, who had just then received Jesus, or we had already received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So they had the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, right? But there is something else that is happening because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
this whole experience of being submerged, of being overwhelmed, of, of being dipped in the Holy Spirit, being filled, we can use that word, right? The Holy Spirit. So this is for every believer. So it's not one and the same. It can happen at the same time, like the house of Cornelius, right? They get the indwelling presence, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Same time, one package, everything is done. Or it can be like Samaria. There was a passage of time, people went, Peter and John went, prayed, then the baptism. Or like the disciples in Ephesus, they were actually disciples for quite some time, right? They knew only of the baptism of John. But Peter go, sorry, Paul goes there and teaches them and then prays for them. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see that it can happen right then, but it can happen over a period of time also. But it's for all believers. Right? Any more, any clarity, anything? Right? Okay. Okay, so uh, Sunny, um, when you are speaking about Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, um, we can see Holy Spirit was there in the Old Testament. What is the meaning of Jesus saying when he is glorified, he will send the Spirit again? So um, we can look at John chapter um, 14, right? Um, John chapter 14, where the Lord was specifically talking about this very thing, right? That um, that there was there was no baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit, like we studied in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on people for a specific purpose, for a specific assignment, and He would empower them to do certain things, supernatural, you know, uh, prophetic words, prophetic acts, and and that that is it. So people would go to that person to receive, to hear from God, etc. Kings would go, you know, to get guidance and so on. Right. So that is what we see in the Old Testament. But in in the new dispensation, we see some that has changed. Um, the Lord Jesus teaching um, in John chapter fourteen, right, fourteen and verse twelve, he says, um, I'm sorry, uh, verse fifteen. If you love me, keep my command commandments. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it can neither see him nor know him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay, And I will not leave you orphans, I will come again. Okay, So here, here he's saying, I will pray the Father, I will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Okay, so the Lord is talking about the helper, the work of the helper, the ministry of the helper, um, and that is something that that's going to happen, right? Um, if you if you go or down to um, yeah, uh, verse twenty six, right? Again, he's saying, but the Father. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, and so on. He's talking about, the again, the work of the Holy Spirit, um, an indwelling, abiding uh, work of the Holy Spirit. So when we say this, um, Jesus saying that when he is glorified, he will send the Holy Spirit. He's talking about this very same thing, the promise of the Father, right? Uh, what we saw... Uh, in Acts chapter 1, he's saying, wait for the promise of the Father, this baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, yes, he's indwelling you, but yeah, there is more. Right? So that is what he's talking about there, that the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, yes, praise God, but there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which he wants to, wants for every believer, so that they can be witnesses with power. So that's what the Lord is referring to, right? Okay. Um, okay, so if, if the question, okay, should I be baptized in order to go to heaven? Uh, the answer is no. We don't have to be baptized either by water or by baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to go to heaven. Who goes to heaven? Sorry. Who goes to heaven?
Who? Yeah. The one who's saved, because he's a savior, right? The one who saves us from sin, the one who clothes us with righteousness. So how is a person saved? Romans chapter 10 is very clear. Uh, let's look at that verse. Um, Romans 10, verses 9 onwards. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? So that's how a person is saved. So verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So a person is saved. Um, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, and so on. So this is how a person is saved. And a saved person is the one who, you know, who, who, whose dis destiny is changed. So the whole direction is heavenward and not hellbound. Right? So that's the person who is saved. So what is water baptism? It's a loud proclamation. Hey, I am saved. It's also obedience to scripture, right? Obedience to scripture, saying that, hey, I want to proclaim, I want to declare that this is what happened to me. I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to Christ. It's a, just like what, you know, communion, it's a declaration that this is what happened to me. It's an act of obedience. Whenever we obey, obey, whenever we are actually submitting to the scripture, submitting, whenever we submit to God, a lot of good things happen. Authority. Submit to God, this is the devil and he will flee. Right? So we are submitting. There's a lot of things happening. Right? All good things. But water baptism will not take us to heaven. It is to believe, to receive Jesus, that he is one who is our savior. We are born again because of that and because of which we go to heaven. Okay, Because people might have question about you know, Acts chapter 2, I think that's where, you know, a lot of um, questions of this nature come, you know, like uh, you look at Acts chapter 2, where Peter responds, right, to the question, because Acts chapter 2 verse 37, they ask the question after the message, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, he's, he's preaching about Jesus, He's preaching about, you know, from the Old Testament, etc. So they ask the question, what should we do now? Tell us what should we do? Because they are convicted in their heart. Then Peter says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. So somehow people have come to you know, put that all together and say, be baptized and you will receive remission of sins. But the fact is, he says, repent. Repentance is what, you know, positions us for salvation. So this baptism, there's nothing magical in the water. Right? Baptism is a, is, a, is a very loud, yet non-verbal declaration, proclamation. Loud declaration to the people, to the spirits, spiritual world. You're declaring, I belong to Jesus. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Okay. So he says here, uh, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes people use that to say, you know, you must be baptized in order to, in order to be, uh, you know, cleansed from sin, to receive remission of sin, or, you know, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Romans chapter 10, that's the thing. And also the lives of people that we see. Right, Cornelius' house where they baptized before they received the you know Holy Spirit. No, they received. Right. Okay. Um, right. So I think um, that is sufficiently answered. Okay. So let's look at um, another another question, which is in the book itself. If you don't have any further questions on this, what about one Corinthians twelve and verse thirteen? Okay. This will, you know, we will, we will again 
uh, come up with this when we look at it, when we look at the gifts of the Spirit, right? What about 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13? Okay, let's look at that verse. What is this 1 Corinthians 12? 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized. That, that word again. We were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Okay, so people might say, by the Holy Spirit, I'm already baptized. I'm already baptized in one body. Okay, So we need to understand that, uh, well, the Bible talks about several baptisms. Okay. Like we know, there is baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is baptism of water, water baptism, right? Let's look at that, right? Um, Ephesians 4 and verse 5. Let's look at, let's read that verse. Ephesians 4, verse 5. Sorry. Um, where, you know, Paul is saying there is one body. Uh, I'm reading from verse 4. There's one body and one spirit. You are all called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay. So they say, there's only one baptism. You're already baptized. It's only one baptism. Paul is very clear. One baptism, one God, and Father of all who is above all to you all. So we can, you know, people use that verse also to say, there's only one baptism. Why are you confusing? There's only one baptism. You're already baptized. You're already placed in the body. You're already made to drink of the Spirit. There's only one baptism. But we see that. The scripture talks about, yes, there is one baptism that saves in the sense that we are placed in the body of Christ, right? We are placed in one body. And that is what 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about, right? We are immersed. We are somehow placed in the spiritual body of Christ, okay? We are baptized into one body, saying that there is a few, you know, there is a spiritual body of Christ. That's why we can say, I'm part of the body of Christ, the church is called the body of Christ, right? Um, what do you say in Hindi? De, Prabhuka De. Yeah, that's what it says. We are placed in the body of Christ, immersed, baptized. Okay. Then there is water baptism. So Ephesians 4 5 says one baptism, but there is water baptism also. Is that the one baptism? Right? Then we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. So we see that there are at least, you know, we see that three baptisms are mentioned. One, um, uh, baptized into the body of Christ. There is water baptism and baptized by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we see this difference. And we see these kind of, uh, these three baptisms. We can also say, we can see the difference in who does the baptism. Okay. What a baptism, who does? Any spiritual leader, maybe fellow believer, baptizes in water. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, who does? It's Jesus, very clear. Is it Jesus, Lord Jesus, who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire? He's the one who baptizes. Okay. The other baptism of being baptized in the body of Christ, that is also something that the Lord does. Like we cannot do that. Right? It's a spiritual work which is done by the Lord. Okay. Okay. So is that clear? So we see three baptisms. Baptism into the body of Christ, water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism. Okay. And Ephesians 4, 5, where Paul talks about one baptism, he's talking about the baptism that uh, uh, being placed in the body of Christ. There's only one. There's no need for, again, again, to be placed in the body of Christ. Okay. Okay. Then, um, um, okay, the question is, the baptism of the Holy Spirit has to be conducted by in the church on a regular basis i'm sorry ashani you you have a question i uh, yeah go ahead please yeah it was from the last section 
Can you explain? I still understand what it says in the scripture where it says Jesus said, I'm out of um, your, I your guess. mic is muted or something here is muted. It's not coming. I'm not able to hear. Monitor. Check, check. It's it's coming. No, it's coming, right? Okay, Shani, go can you go ahead and um yeah, it was in the last so section. Like increase it. Can you hear me? Um no, I'm not able to hear. Oh, it's that's loud. My voice is loud. I can enter. My volume is loud. Check. I can reduce my volume. Check, check. In the, in the monitor. Check, check, check. Oh, it's still loud. You can bring it down. In the monitor, you can bring it down. So, um, just only in the monitor. Okay, so, um, Shani, I'm not able to hear you for some reason. What you're saying. Maybe if you can put it on the chat uh, quickly. We'll answer that, right? In the meanwhile, we'll we'll answer Gertrude's question. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has to be conducted in the church on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's good to teach because you know, in a church, people can come from various persuasions. Maybe people who do not know about this. Maybe they come from another church which does not practice this, uh, etc. You know, just like we see. In those five instances in the book of Acts, we see those several different kinds of people, different circumstances under which they, you know, come to follow Jesus. And so it's good to teach uh, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and to minister. Yeah, you can do that on a regular basis, like we, um, like we uh, do here uh, at Old People's Church every alternate month. So at least six times in a year, we do that. Right? Okay. okay. Um, so I, I'm not able to hear the monitor, okay? So we'll try to fix that, um, Gertrude. I'm not able to. I, I can see you're unmuted, but I, I'm not able to hear. So you can go ahead and, um, yeah, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, okay, my question is answered. Uh, can somebody try saying something? Hello. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Can I ask my question then? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah. It was in the last section. Um, I know you explained it, but I still don't quite understand. Can you explain when Jesus said, out mm -hmm. of your belly shall flow rivers of living water? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, so the whole explanation, uh, so several, uh, you know, um, translations of that belly, heart, innermost being. Right, we see that, and uh, all are very valid. So, it's talking about the spirit man, right? Where the Holy Spirit dwells. So, he's talking about the fact that the work of the Holy Spirit um, is like that river that is flowing out of a person's life, right? And the Holy Spirit releases gifts, revelation, understanding, whatever, and then it flows out like a river touching other lives. Okay, so, the river. If you, if you look at fountain, okay, fountain satisfies us personally, but the river touches the community. Like nations are impacted because of the flow of the river. So, so it's talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the influence and impact um, that a person can have because of the river flowing out, right? Because of the, um, and that's what the Lord said also that you will be witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria, out of us, uttermost part. So, he wants us to be witnesses like that, that the river flowing out in power, in transformed lives, and so on. So that's that's the thing. So it's about influence and impact um, that flows out of a person because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, so Gertrude, uh, I, I hope that I, I think I can hear people now, so you can. Uh, yes, Pastor, because. Uh... I've been a believer, but I've never experienced this uh, a separate session for the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit being prayed. So yeah. I think I will speak to a pastor and ask them to do it in a church. Yeah, and also, um, I think, uh, see, from what you said, you said that you experienced new tongues, new utterances today. Yeah, this is right? during so, my own prayer time, pastor, I experienced yeah. So New that's tongue. so that's it, you know. You're baptized, and you're already praying moon tongue. So, uh, and that's fine. 
No, but if you're talking about the, the other believers, yes, yeah, other be... believers were baptized uh, recently. Hmm. Um, I know that uh, they have not experienced this gifts pastor in right. our church. Yeah, so so we will, you know, we will actually look at some of these things. What can be hindrances? Why is it that you know everybody can, but not everybody does? You know, we we'll, yeah. we'll look at that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank and you, then, Pastor. yeah, most welcome, Sunny Moses. Um, is it necessary to make the declarations such as water baptism? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that question. Um, so is it necessary to make the declarations such as water baptism of what we do in church? Um, are you saying that the church should actually teach on water baptism and do it? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that question. Um, yeah, in church. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's important because that's the, um, the early church practiced. And like we, you know, like we saw, like during the Dark Ages, 480, 1480, a lot of things... A lot of these biblical scriptural practices was not part of the church or the so-called church, right? What was once thriving, flourishing, with all these things were just part of living normal church or normal life of a believer, somehow got pushed or it, it, was, it was never there, right? Um, so the Lord is, you know, we saw the reformative moves or the moves of the Holy Spirit and bringing back truth back to the body of Christ, starting with the reformation, you know, salvation, not by works, but by grace through faith uh, or through, you know, you know, by grace through faith. So starting with that, the several moves of God, bringing back, you know, uh, you know the power of God and healing, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the the every saint being a minister, you know, the, the fivefold ministry gifts and all that uh, is being brought back to the body of Christ. Right? So we see that, uh, yeah, it needs to be taught. Um, these are foundational things that we need to teach in church and um, minister as well. Right? Okay. Um, will we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Book next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, some practical things yes the book is there you can you can download whenever you want it's there in the classwork section so you could do that uh, and also keep it handy till we finish it right um okay the question is how do we progress in the holy spirit without neglecting is that part of the question without neglecting um without neglecting the voice of the spirit without quenching the spirit right so it's a, it's a journey it's a walk of, uh, it's a relationship, right? So uh, if we have offended, if we have quenched, if we have grieved the Holy Spirit, the thing is to get back, right? 1 John 1, 9, when we confess, there is repentance, um, and then we, we get back in fellowship, and we continue our walk with Him. Okay, when is our first quiz? Um, it'll be next week. So it'll be released online, and you can um, you can check the stream. It'll be announced, so you'll get it in your inbox as well. That'll be the first quiz, right? Uh, well, we have. I'm sorry. Will we have like a week to complete it? Two weeks or the quiz? I'm sorry. Do we have a week too? Do we have? Will we have a week to complete the quiz? Or yeah, week? you'll have some time. Yeah, maybe not a week, but less okay. than that. Maybe um, three days. Maybe online students. I'm talking specifically about online students, e-learning students will have, of course, end of term to complete. Uh, In-person students, it will be one hour. So you need to complete it in one hour. So that's the thing. So we'll have it uh, yeah, next week. I'll an announce the dates as well. And so, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Hope that helps. OK. So we'll stop here. And, um, and then we'll meet next class. Right. Thank you.